Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Episode number 111, Mike Duffy, a man of many hats. Presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we get our motion for life on, with an impressive athletic trainer as well as a multi-dimensional coach and begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota, or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon, and you want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to sweethockeycoach.com, that's sweethockeycoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Today I'm really excited about our next guest here on the Hockey Journey podcast. Before this summer, I had no idea who Mike Duffy was, but slowly got to know him after a number of brief conversations we had the last few months. You see, Mr. Duffy wears many hats, but the one I got to see in action with him all summer was when he was training my boys as they prepared for the upcoming winter hockey season. Take a quick listen to some of Mike's professional skills. Entrepreneur, tactical trainer, assault prevention trainer, certified gun safety instructor, personal trainer, martial arts instructor, boxing instructor, public speaker, private pilot, model, and actor. And I know I probably missed a few other talents this guy has. Ow! I think I just tweaked my hammy thinking about how much time and energy went into pursuing all of those interests and passions. He's dedicated his life to empowering others helping them optimize their health, well-being, and personal safety. He's a master coach in nonverbal communication, mental health and resilience, trauma recovery, emotional intelligence, as well as holistic lifestyle and nutrition. So we have a lot to talk about. Join me for the next hour or so as we uncover the life and experiences of Mike Duffy. Mr. Duffy, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Thanks, Lance. I'm, I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Well, a little background, and yes, thanks for being here. Um, um, I've been looking forward to this. We got uh, this was supposed to happen two or three weeks ago, but my wife and I ended up getting the old COVID over Labor Day weekend, so that kind of x that thing out. So I'm glad that we could get this thing going again. And thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I appreciate being here and. Um... I'm glad you guys are okay. I know that's kind of a brutal experience to go through, you know? Yeah, I'm glad it's now and not like in the middle of winter. So, you know, everyone, that's the first time I went through it out of all the times. Hadn't been sick in a while. So it, it, uh, I was pretty grateful yeah. <laughs> when you get, uh, back healthy again. So, uh, here we get, let's get going. A uh, little yeah. background information while you're on the show is, um, there was someone new or there's something new that happened this summer that hasn't happened at uh, my, the Pitlick household. And that was my boys did some training here uh, with you. Yeah. you. You have a, uh, uh, a long list of things that you are, that you specialize in. Yeah. And it's um, I guess it would be non-traditional uh, for most mm-hmm. hockey players and how they would uh, allocate part of their week to, to that type of training. And we're going to talk about that a little later, but um, so that's how you're here. You, there's, there's a connection there. And then we've had a number of conversations Mm -hmm. um, over the summer, just short ones, because that's my busy time. But every time I (laughs) am talking to you, it's like uh, actor, pilot, uh, (laughs) you know, yeah teaching people how to be really good with a knife. And I mean, I was like, holy cow, you got to be on the podcast. So anyways, (laughs) I've done enough talking. How I start all all the shows where I'm interviewing someone 
is I'd like uh, you to rewind the tape and let's take a moment, look in the rear view mirror and go back to the beginning. Where'd you grow up? What was your childhood like? Uh, your parents, siblings, friends. Uh, I have no idea if you ever played hockey, but your introduction to sports. Basically, tell the listeners in a nutshell what the heck it was like growing up Mike Duffy. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I grew up in South Minneapolis, Minnesota. And, um, you know, Minnesota is known for hockey. And I, I, I did not play ice hockey. Um, did you feel so like I, a leper a little bit? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. It's like, you know, during I, the state <laughs> high school hockey tournament, I mean, you're just kind of crawling around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, uh, you know, most of my friends in high school, they played hockey. I had uh, friends in my close circle that played hockey. And uh, I spent most of my time on skis. So when the winter was coming around, I was on skis. And um, I didn't get into – I played roller hockey, which is, you know, similar but not the same. But I played roller hockey – uh, towards the end of high school, I got into it just because I loved I loved rollerblading. But then I picked up a stick and I was like, "Man, this is so much fun!" But I never I, I still don't know how to ice skate to this day, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, I grew up in South Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, my 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 parents are from here. I went to uh, you know when I was a, when I was in uh, grade school, I went to a, a private school, and uh, my parents took me out of a the public schools and put me in a private school. I was getting the shit beat out of me all the time and got in a lot of fights and got in some trouble. But um, they decided to put me in this private school over in Southwest Minnesota or Southwest Minneapolis. And I met a group, good, great group of guys. Uh, my experience was, you know, I didn't know anything any better. I was you know, 12, 10, 12, 13, whatever, however old I was. And I met up with some guys, um, and they became my core group of friends and they lasted all the way through high school. I never, I mean, I played sports Lance. I played, uh, let's see, I played football when I was a kid. Uh, I think I played all the way up until like eighth grade. I played basketball, which I was horrible at. <laughs> it's just, it's like watching a train wreck on a, on a basketball court. Well, and if uh, we, uh, if we, if if anyone saw you, you're you're a little height challenged. I mean, you're not a short guy, but you know, I don't think you're dunking much. Not much, man. So I can uh, see that. <laughs> right, yeah, not much. Um, I played baseball, which I loved. So in high school, I played baseball. I played right field and I was horrible at it. I don't know. It was so weird though. I was like, I would go to the park and I'd play with my friends and I could crush that ball, man. I could crush it. And then I'd go to play in the games and I couldn't hit the ball. I don't know what it was. It was like anxiety or something or something, but so, really? yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then towards the end of high school, I got into, um, I started spending more time in the weight room and primarily because as a kid, I, uh, I, I attracted a lot of negative attention for some reason. I, uh, I got the crap beat out of me all the time. I was, you know, I probably, I wasn't exactly the largest kid in the neighborhood or at school, but for some reason I drew, I drew in a lot of negative energy. So I started, I was like, okay, well, if I want to be better at athletics, I should probably go in the weight room and maybe it'll help me protect myself, you know, at, towards the end of high school, um, you know, I, I started getting into martial arts. So I started taking Taekwondo or karate and I did it because again, I was trying to keep myself from getting the crap beat out of me all the time. And, and my parents wouldn't let me do it because they were afraid that I was going to use it on my younger brother, which is hilarious. Cause he was taking, oh. judo. <laughs> well, he was taking judo and I was like, Oh, if he's going to take judo, I'll take karate. And they're like, no, 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 no. He gets to take judo and you don't get to do anything. Cause you're going to use it on him. So it's like, <laughs> All right, well, I'll just do it myself then. So I started doing karate. Um, and at the time, I, I again, I didn't tell anybody because I just, I wanted to kind of keep it a secret because that's what I thought you were supposed to do. You know, you, you, you do martial arts and you're, you know, you internalize all this stuff. And it's a good way to, ex, to expel a lot of stress and frustration and stuff. So, so I started doing that. And during the whole time, you know, like when the winter came, like I just said before, I was a skier. So I skied competitively um, my junior year all the way through my 20s. Um, I was a mogul skier. Um, I did aerials a little bit, but my I got tired of getting shin splints from 
from Ariel, so I just stuck with moguls. And um, I think 1995, I was out skiing one night, and I, <clears throat> I crashed, and I tore my ACL. And so that ended my mogul career, and I was sitting on the couch, you know, after surgery, and I was just watching stuff like, you know, old martial arts movies or something. And it's back when they had the tube TV, you know, you had to like, get up and <laughs> you had to like, it's when the remote first came out, <laughs> so that's how old I am. Had to change the dial, not a push button <laughs> either. It was a turn it around, yeah, like a circle, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, Mom, will you go change the channel? And I, that's like remotes just first came out. But um, I remember watching this thing on Bruce Lee, and I was like, okay, I got to get involved with this guy somehow. So I don't, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but, you know, when I get better, I'm going to start – I'm going to look for somebody that, that uh, teaches JKD or the philosophy of Jeet Kune Do and Wing Chun and stuff like that, so – uh, it was about 1997, and I. How old were you at this time? I was 97. I was 23. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll rewind though. So back in 1993, when I was in high school, and going through all this stuff, my my dad died. He had acquired HIV through a blood transfusion, and uh, wow. he died in '92, and it kind of uh, just sent our whole family into a tailspin you know and it was like i didn't have that protective figure out there that was supposed to help me and my mom is fantastic but my mom had to run you know two businesses that my dad left behind and she had to figure out what are we going to do with the finances how are we going to pay for the house you know she had to she had to like she couldn't rely on us i mean we don't know anything about finances or anything you know economical economic that has to do with money or anything we're all in high school my sister's right. off at college you know so our family kind of blew up and um my brother when he graduated high school in 95 he took off and he went traveled the world you know so um you know my mom's still trying to figure out what she's going to do with the business i don't remember much honestly i don't remember much between the years of 95 and 97 it was a it's kind of like a there's a lot of trauma in there and i'll be flat out honest there's a lot of trauma in there and it was you know it's just kind of in survival mode and i think everybody was like that in my family at the time do you think you repressed a lot of those memories i do yeah and i don't honestly lance i, I can't I, I remember major events you know i remember going to mexico in a you know in a in a brace and that's about it i don't remember a whole lot so, yeah, wow. I, I, I probably did repress a lot of stuff, and there's a lot of frustration. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the, every once in a while, I'll get together with my mom. She lives pretty close to me, my mom. And, uh, you know, we'll just talk about, like, what happened and how she felt and how she managed the, how she managed the businesses. And a lot of different stuff will start coming out. I'll be like, oh, yeah, I remember that, you know. But in that time frame... Again, I was kind of in survival mode, so I, I gravitated towards martial arts because I just wanted to be able to protect myself. And it started off as wanting to protect myself, and then it just evolved into what I am today, which is help other people protect themselves too. But uh, 97, I again, I acquired, I found this guy in Minneapolis, Rick Fay. Uh, he's like a father figure to me. So when people say Sifu, Sifu in China, you know, Sifu just means teacher or father figure, right? So as, as, as you know, martial arts instructors, you hear sensei, you have professor in Brazil, you have, you know, you have Sifu, you have guru, you have all this stuff. But Sifu is like a teacher, father figure role. And um, I found this guy, Rick Fay in 1997. And I started going to this school in northeast minneapolis and uh it was it was it was like i walked in the first day one of the instructors diana rathborn she was a, a long time student there but she walked she was an instructor as well but i walked in of course i had my you know food my broccoli and rice and chicken <laughs> at the time uh she looks at me and she's just super welcoming and asking you know, how'd you hear about us? And I literally, you know, we didn't have computers back then. So I was just digging through the phone book and the yellow pages. And I found this place called the Minnesota Collie Group. And Collie, K-A-L-I, is a, 
if you don't know anything about um, Kali, it's a Filipino, Filipino martial arts, basically. Um, it said Kali JKD. And I was like, oh, okay. So I went down and checked it out. And she's like, you know, this is what we do. And I looked around and I was like, this is the place I want to be. You know, I look over in the corner and they have what are called mukchang, which is wooden dummy. So if you've ever seen any Kung Fu movies and they're like banging on this old wooden dummy. Yeah. That's what they are. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and um, there's a few of them over on the wall. And on the other side, there's a bunch of rubber tire guys, you know, so like rubber men or tires that look like men that are cut up and you can hit the tires with the with a stick you can hit them with a knife you can you know you can do whatever you want to them there's wrestling mats and all this kind of stuff and um i took my first class and i was hooked man it was a muay thai class and we did i don't know we we did you know punching and kicking and stuff and it was the first time where i had actually been really in a, in a class that dynamic and i was gassed and i was like okay this is where i need to be and so i just started going religiously and the, 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 you know, Rick was really, Rick is really good at, at, uh, he was really good at letting you come in and instructing you and then letting your personality kind of find your own way through the arts. Cause there's, you know, within the school, there was probably seven different martial arts that we were teaching. And some people come in and they gravitate towards Kali again, Filipino martial arts. So they come in, they gravitate toward JKD, Jeet Kune Do, or they come in and they gravitate toward Jiu Jitsu or Muay Thai or CS, like, you know, cage wrestling or something like that. So I just, I tried to get a hold of everything. And it was like, okay, I was, I looked around and <laughs> uh, there have been a few times where I had been out in public and I got in some trouble. And one of the guys that I, um, I had I had confronted or you know gotten in a fight with was he f lit me up pretty bad. <laughs> I learned my lesson, but yeah, he lit he lit me up pretty bad. But I walked in one day and he was training at the Kali group, and I was like, oh shit. And I don't think he remembered me because it was a nightclub and it was dark. And but uh, ever, I mean, I got in this altercation in a bar. You know, or again, I wasn't. I'm not an angel. I'm not like a, you know, I've had my, I've had my ups and downs, but I got in this altercation in this bar and this dude, I, I would, I, I was like, that guy just rolled over me. How the hell did he do that? And then I come to the Kali group one day and he's training at the Kali group and I'm watching him I'm like, Oh, that's how he did that. <laughs> so it's like, I, um, I walked up and started talking to him and oh, he had no, he had no idea who I was because you know, the, the bar was dark and stuff like that <laughs> until about three years later, we were all doing this seminar. And I was like, I remember you, man. I don't know if you remember this, but you fucking lit me up <laughs> in a bar. And he's like, what? And I told him when it was. And he goes, Oh my God. <laughs> he felt, he's like, Oh my God, this, I remember that situation. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of ass kickers at the time. I mean, JKD is, you know, it's a, a very, it's a street oriented art. So when people say, oh, JKD is Jeet Kune Do, um, when they talk about Bruce Lee and they talk about Jeet Kune Do, they talk about like, oh, well, it's kind of a, it's kind of a bullshit art, but there's, it's, there's more to it than just the fighting piece of it. So there's a philosophy behind it. And it's, they call it the way of the intercepting fist, right? So it's always, you're working on a defensive um, aspect. You're working how to counter punch. You're working how to dominate the position and the situation when you're on the street, it's not a cage fight. It's not a, it's not a sport. And it's like all rules, you know, there are no rules. They're, they're you can bite, grab, punch, scrape, kick, whatever you want to do. So I gravitated toward JKD quite a bit. And then I started getting into jujitsu, which I thought was, well, the first time I did jujitsu, um, <laughs> it's funny because I was telling Rem this summer, uh, the first time I did jujitsu, I just giggled the whole time because I'd never hit a man that close to me, you know, crawling <laughs> on top of me and stuff. It was kind of funny, but I, I was hooked, man. At jujitsu, I was like, oh, this is, it was like a mental chess game. And so you take the, you take the martial arts and you really look at them. And I'm going to, this will lead into what we did on the ice with Rem and Rhett. Um, you take the martial arts and it's movement, right? And it's about how to be efficient in movement. 
how to move efficiently in specific, you know, given situations up close CQC, like close quarter combat stuff or, or how to dominate your partner when you're, you know, on, you know, in the wrestling or you know, on the street or something like that. Yeah. And um, I just found it fascinating. It was like, okay, my ADD got me in trouble in school. I, I was never really a, I was not, I was not an A student. I was more like a CD student, um, which was funny because, you know, I was a pilot too, which you had mentioned earlier. And uh, the goal to being a pilot was, you know, go to college, get your college degree and go in the Navy and be a fighter pilot. My fighter pilot guys, my fighter pilot friends were like, dude, you can just be a C student. You're good enough. You're good enough to fly jets in the Navy. And I was like, all right. So I didn't feel so bad. I didn't feel so bad. And it was funny because when they, you know, I'll, I'll, go back to what I was really talking about when when these guys are talking about flying jets in the Navy it's like some of the best fighter pilots are not A students they're not engineers they're not you know they're not the typical <clears throat> super graduated top of the class you know with honor students it's the C guys that go in and they just love to fly they love to fly they graduated with a you know speech communication degree or international relations degree and they just want to fly and that's yeah. their that's that's their life you know so I was always a C student and, you know, during my ADHD, I was like, I finally found something that I could focus on and I could be obsessed with, you know, obsessed. Like when you guys play hockey, it's like, yeah, you can play hockey, but unless, you know, to be at a level that you guys were at, you got to be obsessed with it. Like you got to think about it. You got to breathe it. I mean, I saw it this summer with Ram and Red. It was like. This is what this is supposed. This is what this is like. This this professional athlete, that caliber of athlete, or that kind of that caliber of competitor, or, or pilot, or whatever. It's like you got to be obsessed with it. Yeah. And somebody, yeah, somebody had said that to me a long time ago, and I was like, you don't want to be obsessed with anything. And then I watched your sons, and I was like, that's what this is like, man. And I and on, I'll tell you the truth. I mean, I have worked with a couple D one athletes they played football and, you know, we did some hand work and stuff. Um, I worked with a couple NFL guys. We did some hand work, but I had never really got in, into and have developed a relationship with them. Like I did with Rem and Rhett and the dedic like the mindset and the dedication, they taught me so much about what it's like in their world, as much as I taught them what it was like to be in my world. So it was, is cool. very, I'm very grateful for being in that situation. Um, yeah, well, let's. I mean, how did that? How did that happen? Because was was this the first summer that you guys trained together? Or did you guys train last summer? Because uh, he wasn't training at the house here. That was something new this year. Well, honestly, Lance, this is kind of a funny story. So I kept saying to him, like, "Man, I don't know how you found me. I don't know what the hell." Like, you know, God brought us together or something here. I don't know what the hell is going on, but um, it, was, it was about March or April. And I run a business with a friend of mine. We do personal protection. And uh, Chris is a big time hockey player. Uh, I think he, he skates all the time. I think he played minors or semi-pro or something like that, but he's, he's huge into hockey. This is your partner. This is my business partner. Yeah. Okay. Um. <clears throat> So I get a call from him. He's like, hey, dude, you uh, I sent a guy your way. His name is Rem Plitnik and he's looking for you. And I talked to him a little bit. This is what he wants. Um, but he said he's been looking for you for a long time. And I was like, what? OK, so, you know, I get Rem's number and I shoot him a text message and we set up a time to talk. And Rem's like, yeah, I've been looking for you for months. <laughs> was like, I felt like Yoda. <laughs> kind of, kind of, yeah. I kind of felt like Yoda, where I was like, "Oh, dude, that's so sweet of you." you know? <laughs> but um, <clears throat> yeah, he's like, "I've been looking for you for months." I looked at, you know, he wanted a specific type of training, and he had been communicating with Paul Check at the time. And for those of you who don't know who Paul Check, he's like, he's just a wizard in the in the holistic, uh, you know, lifestyle, personal training. Um, Health and wellness. Yeah, health and wellness. I mean, the guy is just a genius. And I had done a certification with Paul Check, a couple of them. And so I'm in their database. And, and Rem, you know, communicates with Paul Check on quite a, a, you know, frequent basis. 
so he found my name, this guy in Minnesota that teaches martial arts and is you know familiar with Paul Check. So he's tried to get a hold of me. And the information at the Czech Institute is apparently off because I haven't communicated with him for a while. So he had been calling my old numbers. He had been emailing old emails. <laughs> and then he finally started, he like was searching on the internet and he came up, he came across my name under conditioned response, which is uh, our business. And he got the phone number, but the phone number on the website is Chris's phone number, my business partner. So he called Chris and Chris was like, yeah, who are you looking for? Why are you looking for him? And then Rem said who he was and, and Chris knew who he was, which is funny because Chris is a big time hockey player. Yeah. And uh, so we, you know, Rem and I talked and he was seeking something. And, you know, when we had this initial conversation, it was almost like I knew this guy. I knew this and knew who this, like, I knew this guy, like, is there something about him where the vibration between the two of us? I was like, I've seen this man before. I've heard this before. I've like, I've seen this guy before and I, and I haven't, I don't know. Yeah. I've never, you know, but it clicked and what he was looking for. I, you know, I, I, I could help him with, or I felt like I could. Um, so that's how that whole thing started. And again, I was like, this guy's looking for me. Like I felt like, you know, Luke Skywalker looking for Yoda. Or something like that. It was like, it was pretty cool, man. Definitely. Uh, definitely an honor to work with him. Well, Thank you for the kind words. I know that uh, when his mom listens to this, she'll be very proud. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that's that's awesome. I mean, uh, did because I the the first time that I I come downstairs, you guys are down there because uh, we have our whole or portion of our basement is all matted out, mm-hmm. and I go down there and bodies are on top of bodies. <laughs> <laughs> And I got a kid that I'm training with me that's seeing that. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Follow me. We'll figure that out. Later. <laughs> so uh, how did how did that challenge you to, you know, with the, did that put a little extra? I, I don't want to say work. It probably was a, a refreshing kind of uh, experience for you to have to figure out, you know, how can you meld your world into the hockey world, which you have very little experience or knowledge about? When Rem and I initially spoke, he was seeking something, uh, you know, directed towards martial arts. Doing jujitsu and you're up close and personal and being able to get that kind of aggression out because, you know, we're men. That's what we do, right? We, we got to take some aggression out somehow and jujitsu is a great way of doing it. But when you're up close and personal like that, you start to develop this, this almost dominant personality. You walk through life and you kind of look at the rest of the world and you go, you have no idea, you know, how to protect yourself or how to, how to conduct any sort of, or, um, you know, you would have no idea what to do in a situation where your life is on the line and you have to protect yourself or take a life for that matter. And right. jujitsu, like it, it puts it in perspective because you are literally face to face. You can't get away from the person. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we kind of went down that road, and um, <clears throat> with that, I could start to see what he was looking for, and um, and we kept, we kind of, you know, we kind of kept dabbling with it. And Red, it, Red is funny because Red's a machine. That guy, I've never seen it do like that before i put rhett in a direction and i go go until i say stop and he'll just go until i say stop he's a machine and um rem was looking for that sort of like internal warrior spiritual guide you know or that thing that that uh that we're all looking for and um the martial arts and being on top of him and you know crushing him and dominating him but letting him work and kind of work through some problems uh, definitely helped. We got towards, we started going outside for our workouts and we started doing a lot of punching and that dude, I've, I'm, you know, I know a lot of athletes, but he is super talented. And what I saw come out was, you know, that guy is, he's a force man. He's got a lot of, he's got a lot of, a lot of, he has a lot of channels in him. I mean, he's got, 
He's very athletic, but he's got that beast in him. <clears throat> and it came out a couple times. And I was like, okay, so that's that's the thing that we're looking for. You can bone crush. You can be the, the hardest hitter. You can, you know, you can do whatever you do, but it, it's got to be a mentality. So we took our, our, um, our workouts and Rem and Rec came into me one day and they said, you know, would you like to just, what do you think about doing this stuff on the ice? So Lance, this is the first time <clears throat> where I had ever taken any sort of anything <laughs> and put it on the ice because I'm not an ice guy, right? I'm not, I'm not a hockey player. Right. So I was, oh, yeah. So I was completely open to it. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Now, mind you, I can't skate. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> so the first day I'm on the ice in my shoes and um, we figured out like, we'll get some spikes and, you know, so I can get a little bit of grip, stuff like that. Yeah. It was right. It was as soon as we started moving around on the ice, I saw the animal that I was, that I saw this beast that I, I knew was in there. Right. These guys, <clears throat> they're more comfortable on the ice than they are on the dry ground in this, in this like combative quote unquote arena. Right. And so we started doing banded work, just simple exercises that pertain to generating power and speed and strength for hockey. So we, I recorded a bunch of stuff. Um, but it was really interesting because these guys came up with the idea. It's like, well, why don't we just take the concepts of what we're doing and put it on the ice? And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. So we started doing some exercises. <clears throat> and, and with that, we started doing like some scenario stuff, which is great. And the scenario stuff was like, okay, we're in the corner. You got to fight for the puck. You're up against the boards. How do you control somebody? Where do you control them? What is, what are leverage points? All that kind of stuff. And so I started taking some of the concepts of fighting in the cage and applying it to being against the boards or um, up close and personal like CQC. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what came out was uh, – we all three of us were just like, okay, that's pretty, that's actually pretty sweet. But it was just simple stuff. Like when you're, when you're, you can make contact, right? But there are certain things you can and can't do while you're holding a stick. Like you can't slash or anything like that, but you can't like trip with the stick or anything. But there are things that you can do that may somewhat simulate it that you could possibly get away with. Uh, pressuring the hips to control the hips against the board. You know, where do you push on the body uh, to control the shoulders and direction that they're going to go? And so all this stuff that we started to do, I took from being on the ground or in the cage and applied it on the ice in these close situations. And then we had a discussion. Now, I don't know if you got, if you played like this, were you, I can't remember, were you, did you play defense or what was your position in hockey? Yeah, I was a defenseman, and whatever the least amount of skill was needed to get into the NHL, I had mm -hmm. just enough. I was that guy that was hitting everyone and blocking shots and okay. so not a lot of skill, and both boys would say that to me a lot. Like, you, th Dad, you got no skill. <laughs> I can't help you. So I can teach it now, but okay, yeah. So that's where we're at there. So um, I looked at him, and I was like, okay, in the military – you you know when you're in a platoon typically you're assigned a specific task and a lot of times they've been going away from that and you should know the task of the guy next to you or the guy below you right or the guy above you yeah because when somebody goes down you have to fill that role and so <clears throat> i started taking that i started looking at it like okay you guys are forwards is that what their position is forward yes they're forward i'm a defense i was a defense one yep so i was like okay um, we're going to play like we're on defense. And Rem had said, he's like, yeah, there's, they're moving towards, I, I think he said this, there's, they're moving towards a more positionless hockey player where they can fill every role, right? Minus the goalie or something. Yeah. So <clears throat> I was like, okay, great. So we started playing more defensive stuff, like being in that up close and kind of rough person, like that up close and uh, personal sort of situation where you got to be rough. Like you got to be able to manipulate the body and you're not, you know, you're not dropping people and stuff like that or smashing them into the boards, but it's like, how do I win this conversation or this situation when I'm stuck and, you know, I'm slammed up against the boards or someone's trying to steal me or I got to like 
get the puck out from somebody, you know, and do it in a way that's still within the regulations, but do it in a way that's, you know, sends a statement. Like, don't. Yeah. I'm all about that. I'm all about sending a statement because when I watched you play, um, I, I, I pulled up some videos on you and I was like, this dude is, <laughs> this, dude's, this dude's a beast, man. And defensive players are, they're a different animal. Um, I talked to my business partner. He's, he's a defenseman. He's about six, three, two fifty. And on ice, can you? I can't imagine. You know, I mean, six three two fifty coming at me on ice. It's like that's a big train, man. That's a big. Yeah. That's a big train, and it's a mentality. Like I said, it's a mentality. <clears throat> so when we were on the ice, we started talking about the mentality of defense and the mentality of the attack, right? And the and and the intent of the defenseman, and then pouring that intent into your your um, actions. And what started to come out was pretty, pretty cool. Um, like I said, they're, they're both just, I'd never seen hockey, like that level of hockey player up close, especially on the ice. And the speed they move at was unbelievable. So I was like, okay, you have speed, you have power. Now we need structure, pressure, timing, you know, sometimes momentum. And so we started adding those little elements into playing in the corner or playing against the boards. We would give them drills where they had to like literally be up against each other, almost pummeling like you would on a wrestling mat. And uh, we got done one day and, Re- and Rem looked at me and he goes, that was the shit. I felt like it. I felt like a- <laughs> it was pretty funny. But um, it was at that point where, you know, the two of them, it was like all of a sudden, this, these two different animals started to come out and I wish that we could go back to the beginning of summer and do what we did on the ice all summer long so we could see what came out. But it was pretty, it was a pretty amazing situation. It was like that, you know, those aha moments that some of your players have where they go, Oh shit. Oh, why did, Oh, okay. Why didn't I think of that? Or that yeah. moment where all of a sudden everything starts to click um, is is pretty amazing, man. Like I said, that that sort of situation where I saw their eyes just go, oh, <laughs> and this big smile come across their face. I was like, we got it. Here we go. Well, you know, for all these players that are playing, you know, uh, Division One hockey, playing professionally in the NHL, boys and girls. Um, I train more girls uh, than I do boys, and you know, the one constant in all of them is you know generally they're they're pretty doggone good people um Mm -hmm. and they have an incredible work ethic and passion uh for to see how far they can take this Mm -hmm. uh, which is really cool and you know i'm sure like you know for you if if someone said you're going to be training hockey players in 10 years 10 years ago you would say what really? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but you know, who knows what what's going to happen? Uh, I know that there's a a lot of uh, people that listen that uh, after a podcast is is uh, deployed with a master coach. That master coach gets uh, gets some attention from some of the people that I I get to get in front of, and and that's what it is. We're trying to identify all the different puzzle pieces to be the best version of ourselves for whatever we're, we're training, but it all comes down, you know, to, to the beginning. If we don't have our health and our nutrition, you know, if we're not uh, hitting these core virtues every Mm -hmm. single day that we don't have a chance. Now, if, if people got to see you, you know, you would, You'd say, where does this guy live? You know, does he live in, you know, Plymouth, Wyzetta, Minnetonka, Edina, Shakopee, Farmington? No, he lives in Shredville. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you guys are over, you're working them out over there. You don't have a shirt on. You look like you work for the Secret Service uh, and you're tatted up like an MMA fighter. Um, Couple questions. Mm -hmm. Did Did you ever fight competitively? I did. Uh, I fought for a couple years. I did some um, uh, cage work a couple times, and then a lot of jujitsu uh, competitions. And <clears throat> I learned a hell of a lot, man. I learned a hell of a lot, and I didn't. And I wasn't good by any means. So, and it was amateur. But 
I learned that um, the training is harder than the event, one. <laughs> yeah. And two, I could take a beating, which changed my mentality and how I conduct myself in public and in life in general. Um, I can take a beating emotionally. Now, this isn't necessarily good, but I can take a beating physically and I can take a beating emotionally. I remember the first fight I did, I got, I, I was down in Iowa of all places and I'm supposed to fight this farm kid. And I'd just gotten out of a crappy relationship. And my, and one of the coaches was like, Hey, do you want to take this fight in six weeks? And I said, sure, let's do it. You know, it's an MMA fight. <laughs> I go down there and I paint this woman's face on this dude. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I'm like, you're going to get every piece of frustration that I have ever had for the last two years out on you. Oh man. And, uh, I, you know, so we get in the ring and he's this farm boy from Iowa and we just Lance, we just beat the shit out of each other. And I remember, um, how it stopped was he just, he rung my bell five times, just five consecutive punches and I'm covering on, on, on the, on the cage or on the ropes. And, um, all of a sudden the round stops and I look at my corner and they called the fight because I had covered up, you know, and I was just taking, yeah. I was just taking a beating. So we get done. And the thing people don't know about MMA is, you know, in amateur stuff, it's like, what do you do when you get done fighting? You go to the bar, <laughs> so it's yeah. like, you know, you go to the bar and we're all at the bar and he's at the bar. And it was like, dude, you hit me so hard. He goes, I thought I was going to go down in like the 30 seconds in the round. Cause he hit me, the bell rang. And he hit me and in four ounce gloves, you know, you're not holding back when someone hits you with four ounce gloves. Now, mind you, <clears throat> when you're training, you're used to your coach, your, your sparring partner wearing 16 ounce gloves. He wasn't wearing 16 ounce gloves. Oh, and, uh, really? oh man, that first punch, he hit me, rung me so hard. I was like, oh shit. So I punched him back. It's like the Jedi mind trick. You know, when somebody punches you, you punch him back. And he's like, you hit me so hard. I thought I was going to. I thought I was going to pass out. And I was like, well, you didn't show it. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, and the fight went on. But <clears throat> what I learned was emotional fighting and emotion, like you carry that emotion over. So I had a lot of anger, right? When you carry that emotion, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, into a, a situation like that, even when it's, you know, you got to protect yourself, you're putting yourself at risk. And you're putting others at risk to you put yourself at risk to lose. And so I kind of figured it out. So I get out of the ring. And one of the coaches was um, just an ass kicker. I mean, just an ass kicker. And not I don't mean like just in the ring. I mean, like this dude had a reputation for being brutal on the street, on the cage, this, that. And he walks over to me and he goes, you lost. And I go, yep. And he goes, you didn't really lose, did you? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he goes, you can take a fucking ass beating. You should carry and you should learn something about that. Because when you're not in this room, when we're not in that ring, you're going to be on the street. And just keep in mind, that lesson that you got tonight, you will dominate every time you get into an altercation. And it rang in my head. <clears throat> and it was true. So I did the same thing in the next fight. I still lost, got submitted. But it was getting in there and seeing what you're made of and then coming out and assessing the situation and assessing your performance. Like I'm sure you guys do on the ice, right? Yeah. And then I started doing a lot of jujitsu tournaments and then, and um, you know, it's a hundred percent, it's 110% balls to the wall, fire, firewall to throttle. You know, it's like, you see what you're made of. You win some, you lose some, but <clears throat> being in that element, it taught me how to, cage that animal when it needs to be caged and then let the animal go when it needs to go and every once in a while you know it's like i look at it i was told i worked with this guy in the cia and he had said something to me it's like it's not like the it's not like the switch ever turns off it's like the volume gets turned down to low right so the beast is always right on the edge of of coming out but you have to understand that when it comes out, there are repercussions, but the volume goes up when it needs to go up and the volume goes down when it should go down. And in those lessons, it taught me a ton about fighting 
So it's not just about, you know, you fight with people. It's like you, if you want to conduct yourself as a, you know, a productive member of society, you can't be out there fighting on the street and causing problems, right. but <clears throat> you can be a dangerous individual, a dangerous individual. Like Jordan Peterson says is, is a good individual because you have the capacity to create massive amounts of destruction. You just learn how to channel it, you know, having not having that sort of capacity and just being a pacifist and being weak weak i mean weak meaning like you have the inability or you refuse to look at yourself in a position where you might have to protect somebody take your life or find out who you really are in those kind of situations there's no virtue in being weak so <clears throat> it started to transform myself as a martial artist i would prep for fights or I'd prep for competition, and I would, I would, the, the feeling that I got, and I'm sure this is what it's like when you guys play hockey, man. You prep for that, you prep for that game, and the feeling that I got was like, okay, I like this feeling. I'm confident. I'm powerful. I'm, you know, I, I'm commanding, and that is how I started to run on a, you know, on a regular basis. And that's what I like to teach people. It's empowering to know that you have the capability. That you are, <clears throat> you're a force. And it doesn't have to be a violent force, but you're a force, you know, and people see that. You walk down the street, you get on the ice, you get in the cage, you get on the mat, and people look at you and they go, oh, shit, this dude knows something. So <clears throat> the whole idea of being tatted up and stuff, this is all, it all comes from insecurity. It all comes from being beat up. It all comes from not wanting to be f***ed with. It all comes from getting the crap beat out of me, wanting to be the best. And it's an expression. You know, tattoos are an expression. But what it does, it's literally being almost 50 years old, you know, hanging with guys that are half my age, training with them, being with kids half my age and training with them and doing what I do for a living, I have to stay in shape. But I chose the path because of what happens you know, when I was younger, which was got the crap beat out of me all the time. Now, I lived in a household where there was no abuse. I went to a school where there was abuse, and that's why my parents pulled me out and stuck me someplace else. I had friends, quote unquote, friends that were just shitty, that liked to beat me up and all this kind of stuff. Friends, right? Yeah. And so outside the household, I was experiencing a lot of crap. Inside the household, they had no idea what was going on. And so some people experience the opposite, you know, they experience the abuse from the inside. But when you spend eight hours a day at a school and your teachers are slapping you with rulers and telling you you're a piece of shit and you're not going to learn anything, and then you go hang out with your friends thinking that it's going to be better and they want to beat the crap out of you. And, you know, it's like it, it does a number on your psyche at a young age. <laughs> so uh, when you were talking about, you know, repressing some of those emotions between you know, 95 and 97, I had repressed a lot of stuff. And then I finally started to find my, my path. And then what you personally, what Lance and what Rem and what Rhett saw of me is just an expression of trauma. And I, I think people need to understand that. It's like you choose the path. Sometimes you choose the path because of trauma. You, you are who you are. You are your personality, how you conduct yourself, everything because of some traumatic experience or something that pushes you in the direction that you know you are today so i want to ask because you know in knowing paul check and the check institute uh you know the guys he he uncovers so many things and he's been doing it forever that uh, just help people optimize their 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 health uh, what drew you to him and when did that happen? What drew you to him to, to take his courses? Because, you know, that's, that's a 1% of people doing something that what you did going to the Czech Institute. Yeah. So I, you know, I flew, um, I flew multi-engineer planes. For, I was a pilot for a little while and I, and I was, you know, Something hit me at one point. I hadn't eaten in six days. I hadn't trained or I hadn't eaten in six hours. I hadn't trained in six days. And I was like, okay, this job is not going to, this isn't going to be for me, which was tough because ever since I was a kid, I wanted to fly and I finally got to fly. And it wasn't the route because during the time of, uh, you know, flying and um, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, actually, I said, during the time of flying, 
I got so sick of college and I don't know if a lot of people, I mean, maybe they have experienced this, but I stopped going to college. I'm so bad at math, Lance, that, you know, when you go at the time, when you, you get, you go to college, there's prerequisite courses to go. You have to go to in order to get college level math. Well, I started at the first prerequisite course, which I think was like math 89, which is basically like, fractions (laughs) yeah you know and so i had to take math 89 and the next was math 92 and then next after that was math 94 and then math 96 and then eventually you take college level math well math 96 i couldn't pass i tried it three times and it was like you know pre-calculus and all this kind of shit and i was sitting there going why do i need this why do i need to learn this to fly because I was flying at the time, and I was, like, in the airplane doing my fuel flow charts. It was, like, tr- you know, doing geometry. I love geometry. So it was a lot of geometry, a lot of just basic fractions, which I got. Nothing that had to do with calculus whatsoever. I tried doing math three times, and I failed. And I was, like, I just chewed up a year and a half of trying to go through a math course. <laughs> I, was so, I was so mad. Um, and then there's some other things that had to happen. And I was, I figured it out where I was like, this education bullshit is just not for me. I could keep flying, but it was coming out of my own pocket and then finally get a job. It's like, I'm getting paid small amounts of money to fly an airplane. Now this isn't what I want to do. So I stopped flying and I got into personal training. In fact, <laughs> I stopped flying and my mom's like, we're going to go. I traveled for quite a bit <clears throat> and I came back from Europe and, uh, my mom's like, okay, you need a job. Why don't you think about being a personal trainer? I was like, no, I don't want to do that. And so <clears throat> I needed a job. <laughs> so I, uh, I got a job at this place in Minneapolis, and um, I befriended this guy. And his name is Keith. And Keith was heavily into Paul Check. I think he was like Paul Check level two, holistic two. And... Um, <clears throat> So, you know, I was like, okay, well, I need to get a certification. Keith, which one do you think I should get? And I was like, should I do ACE? Should I do NASM? And he's like, nope, I think you should do check exercise coach. And I was like, okay. So at the time, it was like 2005, I ordered up the material and I looked at it and I was like, I am never going to learn all this stuff ever. (laughs) Um. But eventually I just, he, I had him as a tutor. So I would meet up with him and a couple and another person that's uh, was Czech certified at the time. And we just went through the stuff and it was the vocabulary that I didn't understand. You know, it was like pre is essentially, if you look at it, a lot of it is pre chiropractic stuff, understanding intercompartmental pressure of the abdominal wall, you know, how, understanding how the spine works, knowing all the muscular system, the musculature and the, and the abs and the, and the back and how everything functions. <clears throat> And then, you know, at the time they give you DVDs. So you sit down and you watch Paul do his presentation. And then when you're done with that, you take the test and you have to go through a five day course. Well, so I got, uh, I got halfway through my, my check certification. And I was like, I am never going to learn this shit. (laughs) It's like, it took me forever. I called the check Institute and I was like, I don't, you know, how long does it take? You know, how long do how long do I have to to um, you know, pass this quality this, this certification? And they're like, don't. There's no time frame. Just get it done when you get it done. So I said that was kind of a relief because I was having a hard time. Again, my my ADD was so bad. It was like sit down in front of a television, watch a DVD, go through it. I couldn't do it. It I had to teach myself how to do it. It was super hard. But when I was done. It, the, the, the Paul check information that I got was by far ahead of its time and better than any certification that I have ever acquired. I have, uh, I have a FMS, uh, kettlebell, uh, NASM, uh, precision nutrition, a couple other ones, but the Czech Institute was super good at kind of <clears throat> laying out all their information. And then uh, when they came here, and I, I mean this, uh, you know, kind of ahead of their time, maybe, well, maybe I was just naive to it, but 
we did some holistic work. So we, there was a holistic certification. So I was like, okay, I'll do that. But they were talking about like artificial sweeteners and how they're processed and Monsanto and all this kind of stuff in 2005. And it was really when I started to, to catch on to what Paul Check was saying that I believe this guy, man, I will follow this dude wherever he goes. I'll listen to whatever he says. And, and, uh, you know, I, I continue my education with Paul Check for sure. I had done NASM and it wasn't the detail that was that was in uh, Paul Check was far above and beyond anything else. Like it was the stuff that people need to hear if you're going to be a trainer, right? How the body works. This is how it works. How to load the system, how to load the system, how to program to load the system properly, you know, how to cor like corrective exercise. I mean, most people talked about corrective exercise, but <clears throat> it was until I got a hold of Paul Check where I was like, this is what corrective exercise really means. And then it, then, it, then I went into FMS, you know, and then CK FMS. And it was like, okay. So I went down this corrective exercise route and, um, you know, Paul Check was the, he was the influencer, I would say, out of the whole thing. And to this day, I still bust out my, you know, my old manuals and I tell people how your abdominal works and compartmental pressure, or, you know, hydraulic amplifier mechanism. I, I tell people this stuff all the time. And it's tough because the average individual, when you train them, unless they speak the language, don't understand what you're talking about. No, and most of the time, they just don't really care what you're talking about, which was super frustrating. And again, I say Paul Check was ahead of his time because when you speak like that to somebody and they don't know what you're talking about, you get the, you know, you get that kind of deer in the headlight look. Yeah. And people go, uh huh, uh huh, and they don't know what you're talking about. So it's like. <clears throat> It's hard to improve the individual when you have to, when, they, when they're not understanding the language that you're speaking, nor do they even give a shit about what you're talking about. They just go, oh, I just want to lose 20 pounds. Okay, well, we can't do it because your hips are out of place because your psoas is too tight. You're, you know, you've had two C-sections and your abdominal wall is not functioning. And they're like, yeah, but I still want to lose 20 pounds. And it's like, okay. <laughs> so I had to kind of rethink how I go about coaching people. And, 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 you know, I mean, maybe you go through this and, and you're training too, or coaching too, where it's like, for the first time I had to say no to people and it was hard. So I was like, I wanted to say yes to everybody. Cause I thought I could help everybody with this information, but I had to say no, you know? And I was like, I don't think we're a good fit, which means yeah. no money coming in the door for me. <laughs> you know, we're all motivated, motivated by money. But at the same time, I was like, I felt insignificant or I felt like a, when I feel like I can't help somebody, it sucks because one, I'm a protector and I want to make sure that they get help. And me saying no to somebody, it's like me saying, I don't have the capability of helping you, which is a shot to the ego. Right. So, yeah. Um, we got two more questions for you. Um, that man, you, <laughs> Your life is this has been awesome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I just it, it is. I mean, I just I'm, I look at this what you've done and uh, the experiences that you've had. So, what what is just a couple questions for? Mm -hmm. What's yeah. a typical day look like for you? Because you're you uh, also you mentioned that you do some um, personal protection, but yeah. you know, go through a. a, a typical day where you know you wake up you when do you work out you know your your food intake and then your day job okay so you know my schedule varies i mean i have a schedule um and in and in executive protection protection and personal protection it all depends on uh when the client needs you so you're constantly trying to build um you know, client relationships and stuff like that. So when you get a contract, it's, it's, you know, you got to figure out how long it's going to be for. So you're always out there hunting, hunting for contracts. And I work with a guy or work for a guy who's really good. He's got a, he, he and I come from a very similar background. And um, so we, there's four, four, five guys on our team, four or five guys on our team. Now we just hired somebody new. And uh, there's so much work that we have that, you know, we're all trying to f fill each other's, we're trying to fill shifts, right? So a typical shift is about four hours. 
Um, and people go, oh, four-hour shift? Wow, that's not very long. But it's pretty strenuous. You know, some days it's like you're always in protection mode, right? So the, the switch is always – the volume is always almost to high. And you got to run like that for four hours, sometimes six hours. Like this coming weekend, I've got a 12-hour shift. I got to protect – high worth individuals which is pretty stressful i got to drive them around i got to do the advanced work um and it's very stressful sometimes and then there are some days where it's pretty low right so the stress is low but the days that there is not a lot of stuff going on people go oh well it's got to be really boring but (laughs) in the protection world it's like if it's a boring day it's a good day i would i would i would to put it into hockey terms i i would imagine would be like um and this is not for you, Mike. I know you're probably not going to understand. It's for the listeners. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but it would be like uh, you're up by a goal uh, in the dying seconds. You're in the defensive end trying to protect the lead. And your head is on a swivel. You're shoulder checking. And you got to do that for four to 12 hours straight. Uh, that's not only physically, but mentally <laughs> exhausting too. So I, I totally know what you're saying. Yeah, that's that. I mean, I'm picking up what you're putting down and that's a good way to look at it. You know, um, it's, a, it's, it's a very emotional, it's emotionally, I shouldn't say it's mentally exhausting. Yeah. So we did a job for a couple of politicians and you know, it was a 12 hour gig and we had to pick them up. We had to do the advanced work, meaning like figure out the routes, figure out two counter routes, figure out who's going to be at the house, who's going to be driving, who's going to sit in the car, where they're going to sit in the car, how we're going to get there with the layout of the, the building, the exits, you know, everything down to, okay, the return routes, the counter return routes, um, the altercations that could possibly happen on the counter return routes. Who's going to sit in the front seat? Who's going to sit in the back seat? Are we taking two cars? Because now, you know, I have a dummy car, this, that. I mean, this is the stuff that goes on. And it's like, and you're armed and you have to pay attention to who's in the crowd. And you have to pay, like, literally walk with them. You can't stick right next to their side, but you have to be, people have to know that you're there, right? Right. <clears throat> that's, that's, a, that's a pretty advanced day. Uh, a typical day for me looks like I get up, eight o'clock I have some breakfast I you know I'll go to the gym depending on what my schedule allows so sometimes I'll have to be at work at 10 uh 10 to 6 or sometimes I'm at work from 9 to 5 some days I'm working at noon to 4 some days I'm working 4 to uh, you know 8 or sometimes you know whatever uh but a typical day is I get up and make sure I have fuel in the system that will light me up to, to keep the motor going for the rest of the day. Right. So I, I typically veer towards more of a fatty food diet. <clears throat> so I eat a lot of, um, I eat a lot of red meat. Um, you know, slow cooker is my friend at this time of year. I just throw a bunch of pork belly and vegetables in the slow cooker and it gives me, you know, two days worth of food. I'll do some brisket and slow cooker, all this kind of stuff. But for the most part, what I eat is, what is good for me, which is red meat. My blood type likes red meat. Um, you know, I, I've never been a fan of the blood type diet, and I'm not really a huge follower of it, <clears throat> but I looked at the blood type diet and it says, if you're B negative, which you, which I am, these are the meats that you should be eating. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and one of them wasn't chicken, I thought. So, or bacon, oh. which is bad because I like bacon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it said red meat. I was like, okay, I'll start eating red meat. And um, I feel great. So, if, you know, red meat does it for me. So I'll have some steak. I'll have some eggs. You know, and the rest of the day is either whatever is in the crock pot, which is some sort of meat and vegetable. Um, I supplement it with protein shakes. The protein shake is a, usually a plant-based pro- protein, very clean, um, uh, and with uh, organic berries. So about my physical training, it's like, again, whenever I can get it in, really, sometimes it's 10 a.m., sometimes it's 7 p.m., but I try to do it on a regular basis. Um, the, you know, a lot of people are like, well, <clears throat> if you eat a high-protein, high-fat diet, do you eat any carbs? And I'm like, yeah, you, you have to have carbs. You can't, you know, this, this whole carnivore diet is great, but if you're an athlete, you got to have carbs, so... I have protein shakes with berries in them. 
I load it before my workout. I eat tons of carbs after my workout. Um, you need the glycogen. You need the glycogen. Um, you need to replace the glycogen that you burned as well. So um, my, my workouts aren't, I don't spend two hours in the gym. It's maybe an hour. Um, I have it, I try to go on a time basis. So I'll give myself, you know, maybe a minute between sets, depending on what I'm doing for the day. Some days it's Olympic lifting. Some days it's power lifting. Some days it's a conglomeration, uh, conjugate style workout. Some days it's just go in and move, you know, some days it's just move some weight around, get the pump, do some bodybuilding stuff. So I've kind of gotten it to a point where <clears throat> my training has to match the lifestyle that I have, which is if I'm going to be protecting somebody, I, I damn well better be able to run. I better be able to fight. I better be able to be, you know, think cognitively and have a good, con clear, clear mindset. I better be able to be healthy enough to operate. I don't have cancer. I don't have diseases. I don't have diabetes. I don't have to take drugs while I'm at work. I don't have to worry about any sort of, I mean, in fact, I've never, I haven't been to the doctor. I don't know how long, um, but I have to, my, my exercise has to fit my lifestyle. And I'm sure with ho like hockey players too, like you, you choose the performance, you choose the exercise and the, and the workouts that fit your lifestyle. Right. Yeah. And so with my job, it's like, you know, there are days where I, I do strictly CrossFit. Um, there are days where I call it conditioning CrossFit. So, so it's like, I'll go in, I'll do a conditioning day. Uh, and there are days that are recovery days. Like I just spent yesterday up at this place called Hypercharge. I'm going to plug that Hypercharge in the, in the right. Maple Grove. And Lance, if you, if you ever get a chance, I want you to go there. It is unreal for performance and recovery. Um, all sorts of different things, unorthodox things that the media should be talking about, but they don't, you know, using voltage to help uh, am, uh, create uh, healthy cells like electricity, uh, um, red lights, red light therapy, super oxygenated exercise, um, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's, it's amazing. I went there yesterday. I left there and I was like, I can't believe I don't come here on a regular basis because I need this. So recovery is a huge piece, especially <clears throat> if you're going to be a hockey player. You gotta, you're gonna beat yourself up like that. You gotta, have, you have to recover too. So, <clears throat> sleep is a huge thing. I know a lot of people have sleep. I have trouble with sleep. So I have to eat the things and supplement according to whether or not I'm gonna sleep. All right. So I, I'm like everybody else. I I have caffeine. I've probably taken you know three to four hundred milligrams of caffeine in the morning. Anything else after that, I can't sleep. All right. So. When I sleep, I have a cocktail. I call it a cocktail before I go to bed, and it's magnesium glycinate. It's valerian root. It's vitamin D. It's um, uh, magnesium oxide to help clean out my digestive system in the morning. It's like, uh, you know, I have, I have a cocktail that I take to help me sleep when I go to bed uh, and recover because you recover essentially when you sleep. I don't know if people know that or not, but that's that's <laughs> that's that's true um and so my day is like it is all the same but it fluctuates depending on time and availability when i can do the things that i'm supposed to do does that make sense oh yeah yeah your schedule would drive me crazy it's oh. frust it's frustrating sometimes man because i you know i work weekends weekends are high times and it's like my, my days off are today and yesterday. So I have Tuesday, Wednesday off, you know, and it's frustrating because yeah. when people are like, Hey, we're going here on the weekend. Do you want to come? I'm like, no, I've got to work. And I don't mind because I don't, I like working, but it's not a typical work week where it's Monday through Friday, Saturday, Sunday off, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, it's like the, the NHL life. Every day is a Friday, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know it depend, depends on what day it is for you to be a Friday. So, yeah. um, Man, this has been fantastic. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And yeah, I you. want to, before I let you go, um, where can people find out some more information about how you can, how you've been helping others uh, and if they want to get in touch with you? Um, so there are a few different links. Um, my website is archangelds.me, Mike Echo archangelds.me and it just kind of gives a, a, a basic view of what i do 
uh, for personal protection, right? We have, um, we didn't get into the firearms aspect of it, but I train heavily in the firearms because it's a piece of what I do. Um, and, it's a and also task. knives too, right? And, <laughs> yeah, knives, man. Holy cow. <laughs> uh, but it's, a, you know, learning how to use every weapon to protect yourself, essentially, is you know, making yourself a human weapon is basically what it is. Um, there's another one called conditionedresponse.us. So if you're interested in taking classes uh, with personal protection, firearms training, you can contact my partner and I. Uh, we do that. <clears throat> and uh, real estate, we do another, you know, this is kind of interesting. We train real estates because there's a, a big problem with real estate agents right now in violent attacks. Yes. And, uh, yeah. It's, it's awful, man. Some of the stuff that you hear is just awful. Wow. So. Uh, vigilantagent.com. Uh, you can find us if you're a real estate agent. We hold classes and seminars to um, you know, teach people about awareness and situational awareness and what to do um, if you have any sort of conflict. A lot of the um, real estate agents these days are, are, are going to permit to carry. And the thing about permit to carry, even though I'm a gun person, is it's like being a hockey player, right? Just because you give somebody a hockey stick doesn't mean they're a hockey player. <clears throat> and so I'm really adamant about this. If you're going to have a tool, then you better train with that tool because you're going to put somebody else at risk if you don't know how to use it efficiently. Yes. And so that's what we do is when we tell real estate agents about this kind of stuff, it's like, okay, we can train you and average individuals too. It's like, yeah, we can train you, but you know, the most, the most average person comes in and they goes, oh, I want to get my permit to carry. Oh, I want to learn how to shoot. And it's like, okay, well, you bought a gun. Awesome. And you let it sit in your safe. You are, you are just as much of a threat to the people around you as the threat is to the people around you. Yeah. You know, so I am huge on if you're going to use a tool or use a gun or use a knife or learn how to protect yourself, you better train with it on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, I'm on social media, uh, Instagram, Sir Michael James, or it's Sir Dot Michael James. That's Instagram. Instagram is interesting. It's just kind of a hey, you know, these are a bunch of pictures and videos. It's like self advertising, right? Gotcha. And I'm also on Facebook um, if you want to interact with me. But those are the those are the best ways to get a hold of me. Can you text me those, and then I'll put those in the description uh under the episode so it would make it very easy for people to uh find you yeah absolutely uh, okay. absolutely mr duffy i think that is a wrap for this episode i want to thank you for sharing your experiences wisdom and expertise uh as this episode says mike duffy a man of many hats you've <laughs> worn and still wear many hats in a day as you continue to help educate train coach and empower others to optimize their health, well-being, and personal safety. Uh, I wish there were more people in this world like you, my friend, because it definitely would be a better place. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing your life journey with us. And if anyone's interested in getting a hold of them, like I said, I will put everything in the description. But uh, I've enjoyed this chat. Maybe we'll do it again. We'll just pick a topic and uh, start wrapping. Oh, I'd love to, man. This was excellent. Thank you for your time, Ryan. So I, I really appreciate this. Thank you. Yeah. Good. So um, you have a great rest of your week. And if there's anything that I can do to help you, uh, what you got going on, please don't hesitate to ask. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, man. You have a great rest of your week. You too, brother. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed learning about Mike Duffy's life journey and all the different hats he's worn and continues to wear. From my perspective, he's a pretty cool dude. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It would really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.